Well, this afternoon I'd like to begin with a newspaper article. This article appeared May the 25th, 1987. It was an unusual story. In fact, it was a story that grabbed so much attention, or at least grabbed a certain amount of attention, I'm not sure exactly how much, but it appeared in the New York Times. But it wasn't about anything in New York. It was about an unusual event that took place in the small town of Conyers, Georgia. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the geography of Georgia and the Atlanta area, you'll know that Conyers is a small uh, town, small city, uh, just east of Atlanta. When I was pastoring in Athens, Georgia, Conyers was a part of my pastorate. I visited in that area quite a bit. I knew a lot of people from that area, knew, of course, we had a lot of, uh, several members from that area as well. But this article was written by William Schmidt, and it was about a basketball team, the Rockdale County High School Bulldogs. Rockdale County is the county where Codgers, the city of Codgers is. Uh, the Rockdale County High School Bulldogs won the AAA High School State Tournament in Georgia in that particular year. It was shocking, that was in 1987 as I said. It was shocking and they had a lot of come from behind victories. They had a lot of adversity that year. And they won the final game, the championship game by coming from behind. It was one of the most amazing games in high school history in the state of Georgia. Therefore, this particular team grabbed national attention, not because of their state championship, but for another reason. A huge trophy, a basketball with the autographs of all the players, and a framed copy of the front page of the Atlanta newspaper announcing them the state basketball champion for that year. Their coach was a well-known individual in that area. His name was Cleveland Stroud. And Cleveland was a local boy who had made good and took his team all the way for the first time in school history to win the state championship. They built a huge trophy case just for this state tournament, or just for the trophy from uh, the championship that year. But then there were some issues. When the season began, there were five regular players who were declared ineligible because of failing grades. So the coach was forced at the beginning of the year to promote players from the JV team. They lost their first four games of the year and ended up winning 21 straight games after that. And then, of course, the state championship. Having received their trophy and so many other accolades from around the country, an internal investigation determined that one of the JV players had been ineligible to play because he had only passed four out of six classes in order to play in the state of Georgia in, in their high school athletics, you had to pass five out of six classes. This JV player was not a starter. He only played 45 seconds in the first game of the state tournament when Rockdale was ahead by 20 points. This created a dilemma for the coach. No one knew what had happened. This was internal investigation. The first thought was, well, we don't, not necessarily his thought, but an average person maybe would have thought, well, we won't tell anyone. We just won't tell them what we've discovered. You see, basketball was over. This investigation was for the future, was for the track and baseball season that had begun. And the individual that was discovered was ineligible for the entire year. Coach Stroud did something so remarkable that it made the news in the New York Times. He reported to the state, to the board that oversees athletics in the state of Georgia, that they had an ineligible player that played in one game for 45 seconds. At that point, the board had no recourse but to award the state championship to the team that Rockdale had beaten in the final game. Their trophy was taken away. The basketball signed by everyone was taken away. The entire trophy case now 
sat empty. Coach Stroud said this. He said, we didn't know he was ineligible at the time. We didn't know it until a few weeks ago. Some people have said we should have been quiet about it, that it was just 45 seconds, and the player wasn't an impact player. But you got to do what's honest and right and what the rules say. I told my team that people will forget the scores of basketball games, but they don't ever forget what you're made of. He went on to say to the local newspaper, they can take away the trophy and they can take away the title, but they can't take away the fact that we won. They can't take away what we did and who we are. That year, Coach Stroud was named the Georgia High School Coach of the Year. Not necessarily because of this, but because it was more than athletics. 45 seconds, such a little thing. But Coach Stroud thought it was important for the young men playing on his basketball team that they knew that even though something so small affected nothing that they accomplished that year, but it was wrong. So therefore, he told them that they were better men for what they did or what the team did than the team that had been the state champion for a short period of time. It's been said that the hardest thing to do for a human being is to admit when you're wrong. It's always easy to compromise. It's always easy to say it's only a little mistake. It's only a small error. And then, of course, we see that all the time. We see it in politics where, obviously, honesty seems to have taken a hiatus for sure and where people are not sincere, it seems, or at least not honest. I can't judge their motives. We see that everywhere. But it's not just in Washington. 600 students were recently expelled from school in India for cheating on an exam. 600 students. According to the website ehow.com, 75% of high school students admit to some level of cheating. In recent years, 125 students at Harvard University were charged with cheating. Just this past month, federal prosecutors charged 50 people who took part in a scheme that involved either cheating on standardized tests or bribing college coaches and school officials to accept students that were either not qualified or athletes that never participated in the sport for which they were given a scholarship. Actresses Lori Laughlin, or Laughlin and uh, Felicity Huffman are among those dozens awaiting federal charges. Others include nine coaches at elite schools, two SAT and ACT administrators, an exam proctor, a college administrator, and a CEO who admitted to helping the wealthiest people get their children in the best schools in the country. The scheme was orchestrated by William Rick Singer, a CEO of a college admissions prep company. Parents pay between $15,000 and $75,000 to have someone else take the test for their children so that the scores would be higher. Clearly, clearly cheating. And yet our society, while of course in this case they are being prosecuted, but our society as a whole looks at so much of this as being minor, maybe not something this big, but a little cheating is it okay? It's a little cheating okay. If it helps you win, if it helps you get into school, what's the problem? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 to begin today. We are approaching one of the most wonderful times of the year. You know, I've often thought that people who don't observe Passover and unleavened bread have no clue what they're really missing. The depth and the richness of what is in these holy days the depth and richness of what we learn, the analogies, the stories, the things that we hear and see through these holy days. It's hard to imagine being without them. It's hard to imagine being without them. Such a, a wonderful thing that, that is there. If you think about it in God's holy days or God's plan of salvation, we uh, celebrate holy days that picture future events. And that's very encouraging. But the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread are the core values of Christianity. 
from the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior to the removal of sin, and it's all sin is the desire. Not some sin, but all sin. Now again, we can say, well, we're only human, and so therefore it's impossible. But if today, if today I were to tell you that when you leave here today, you have resolved 95% of all the sins you've ever committed, they're gone out of your life, you'll never repeat them. You would be thrilled, and what a success that would be. But the days of unleavened bread tell us that 95% isn't good enough. Again, I'm not saying we beat ourselves up because we're not perfect. That's not the point. But the goal of unleavened bread is the removal of all sin. From the smallest to the largest, all sin. And that's our goal, and that's what we strive for each and every year. The Apostle Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I find it unusual that Paul uses this term or this statement twice. And both times he addresses it to Gentile congregations. He refers to leaven and he refers to sin. To me this is absolute proof that these Gentile congregations were observing the days of unleavened bread. Else how would they have any clue what Paul was talking about? You see, Paul used this because in, in, certainly in Corinthians for a very specific purpose, very specific example, he says this, verse 6, he says, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I don't think the Corinthians reading this had any doubt as to what Paul was talking about goes on to talk about keeping the feast. So, again, clearly from our perspective, others may debate or argue over the point, these Gentiles knew about unleavened bread and how would they know about it if it was unnecessary? Why would Paul even bring it up? The depth of the meaning behind unleavened bread should not be lost on us. And as Paul said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, we know that he was dealing with a particular problem in Corinth. The particular problem had to do with it was actually twofold. Uh, the problem with the individual who was living in sin and therefore had to be dealt with, and the way the congregation reacted. As though it's maybe minor, I don't know what they may have thought, but they appeared not to have seen the gravity of what was going on right under their noses. And therefore, the sin that this person committed was impacting the entire congregation, but they didn't know it. It was a little leaven. Now we would say, well, that's a pretty major sin, somebody committing adultery, but it was somehow accepted over a period of time. And Paul compares it to leaven that has permeated now the congregation and has affected others. Look in Galatians chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 5. Once again, the Apostle Paul for the second time uses the same comparison it appears to be a bit of a different case here, but keep in mind this is another Gentile group of people. A Gentile in the sense that they didn't grow up in the Jewish community. They didn't grow up observing Passover in the days of unleavened bread. Someone had to introduce them to this. Or else they would have no clue what Paul is talking about. But Paul says the same thing here, Galatians chapter 5. And look at verse, uh, let's see, verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. Now, the, the context of this, they're talking about circumcision. There were some people bothering them. He goes on to say, I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. You know, that was troubling them. It appears to be a false doctrine or a false approach toward doctrine and the need to be circumcised, at least addressed here. And Paul took uh, objection to that or gave an objection to that. And so this false idea that was being evidently spread within the congregation was like leaven and affecting a lot of people. So you have in one case sin that spread within at least uh, the understanding of it within the congregation that Paul calls leaven. And then here you have a teaching, it appears, that was spreading in the congregation that Paul also calls leaven. Now, why use this particular example if it wasn't, and again, I, I believe it clearly was, that they were observing the days of unleavened bread? 
I mean, I, I think if you were to walk into a Baptist church tomorrow or next week or next month, and you had the opportunity to speak to them, and you began talking about leaven and the days of unleavened bread, how many people would even understand what you're saying? And these are people that profess Christianity that read the same Bible. You see, for the Gentiles to get what Paul was saying uh, to me, completely, completely tell, or tells us very completely, or completely that they were observing these days. And again, in 1 Corinthians, maybe it was during the days of unleavened bread or just before. In Galatians, the timing, I, again, would only be speculation. I'm not sure we would know. But Paul uses leaven. He says a little leaven is destructive. A little thing. It destroys your character. The basketball team from Rockdale High School wasn't destroyed by the disclosure of this small infraction but by removing it and accepting the penalty for the infraction, one can say they became better people, even though it was very small. At least an important life lesson was learned by those young men in a way that they probably could not have learned in another way. I'm sure if you could find them today that they clearly remember this particular incident in their lives. When you think about the subject of little things and how it impacts big things or how it can become a big thing, there are many ways to look at it. There's a book out that came out a few years ago entitled The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference. It was written by Malcolm Glad, uh, Gladwell. The book discloses the principle of how little things can affect other things and then affect other things. Again, the comparison to leavening. Uh, one of the examples used in the book, The Tipping Point, is, is an unusual one. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, maybe some of you have, but if, have you ever heard of the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions? The law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. And it's an actual law. It was actually developed by an individual, a meteorologist by the name of Edward Lorenz. And he coined the term, if you've heard this before, the butterfly effect. Now, he used the butterfly effect because of the stark, uh, well, it's sort of a descriptive way of, of explaining what he did. Uh, Edward Lorenz, as a meteorologist, wanted to find a way to predict when tornadoes or hurricanes are going to come, before they ever get anywhere near being a tornado or hurricane. So he began to run all the algorithms and all the metrics to try to determine this. And he used what had been traditionally used. This was in 1960, what had traditionally been used. But he decided to do it differently. So he decided that he would round off some of the numbers. That instead of rounding them to the nearest a million, a millionth of a part, he would round them off to the nearest thousandth of a part. For example, if the number was uh, if the number was rounded to 506, um, the 506 would be the, the, uh, the thousandths, and instead he, he, I'm sorry, the original was uh, 0.506127, he rounded it off to 0.506. And he was absolutely amazed at the difference it made in all of the calculations by eliminating that small portion and coming to the next. And the difference between those numbers, a million to the thousandth, was the, 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 what was called the butterfly's wings and the, the, the uh, movement of the butterfly's wing and what it would cause in, in the air. So the butterfly's wing and flapping of the butterfly's wing was the difference in those two numbers. And so here's what he concluded. Or here, here, here was this question, does the flap of a butterfly's wing in Brazil cause a tornado in Texas? His findings became known as the butterfly effect. Small alterations in mathematical sequences can cause seriously different outcomes. The term is used in all kinds of ways today, but the meaning is clear, small things make a big difference. So Lorenz explained his theory this way, which became known or is known today as the law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. He said a butterfly can flap its wings and set molecules of air in motion which would move other molecules of air, in turn moving more molecules of air, eventually capable of starting a hurricane on the other side of the world. Now again, it's not literally a butterfly that does that, but the difference or the amount of displacement of a butterfly's wings equaled that small amount of change in the calculations. 
and one would be able to predict more accurately when a storm was coming based upon the change of that calculation. Bruce Barton, the author of The Man Nobody Knows, uh, once said, sometimes when I consider what tremendous consequences come from little things, I'm tempted to think there are no little things. Sofan Chan and Rockman Reese wrote an article in a, an e-zine or a, a, an online magazine called The Art of Happiness. Here's what they wrote. Just as the internet is made up of millions of different computers all linked together to form a massive field of information, so too is your life built out of uh, millions of interconnected memories and experiences. Your life is continuously being built out of tiny pieces of time. One small action connected to the next and each one of these tiny pieces of your life combine into the whole web of who you are. Little things make a difference. I was reminded uh, not long ago of an experience that I had a number of years ago. I spent in my entire life one night in the hospital, one night in the hospital, and that was to pass a kidney stone. And the doctor described it to me. He was going to show me a picture of the kidney stone after it was removed. And I looked at the picture. Now, he had it blown up, and it looked pretty big. I said, why do you call it a stone? It looks like it should be a rock, uh, especially the way it feels. And he said, no, no, it's, uh, and, and it was microscopic, little tiny thing. But the ureter in your human body is the thickness of a human hair. And so even a grain of sand or a stone the size of a grain of sand can bring you to your knees in a way that you could never imagine. Little tiny piece of sand and what it can do to your body. Another article says this, suppose your entire life has been videotaped. Not one second of your life has been left out. You might remember the popular movie, The Truman Show starring uh, Jim Carrey, which highlighted this very situation. Say someone who doesn't like you very much uh, has a copy of this videotape and wants to carefully review it for scenes that would embarrass you. They're motivated to put you in a highly in unfavorable light. They'll edit the videotape and show it to the world. What is there in your life that you would be worried about or mortified for others to see? What little things have happened? in the course of your life. Mahatma Gandhi wrote this, carefully watch your thoughts for they become words. Manage and watch your words for they become your actions. Consider and judge your actions for they have become your habits. Acknowledge and watch your habits for they shall become your values. Understand and embrace your values for they become your destiny. All begins with a little thing. Turn to James chapter one. James describes sin in this particular way. Now he's talking about uh, lust, of course, and being tempted. But he says this in verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. A small thing, only a thought that leads to more and of course, as you read in Scripture, actually sin leads to death. That is the ultimate conclusion of sin, period, and that is death. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden and take a look at something that I always find remarkable when I read it. It's not obviously that you, you haven't read it. I'm sure you have many times. We find in Genesis 1, verse 26, that God chose to create man in His image. Man is the, the pinnacle of God's creation. We're not animals. Uh, we're not vegetables, we are human beings. In verse 26 it says, we are created after God. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and upon every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Man was created on the sixth day, we're told. And man was created in the image of God. Not of God's substance, but with the capabilities that really were far beyond animals. The ability to think, the ability to reason, the ability to plan, the ability to live life a certain way. Animals live by instinct and by you know, the way they are programmed as animals. Human beings can alter their way of life. 
You can stop doing something. You can begin doing something. You can change your life. And every year at Unleavened Bread, we're reminded of that very fact because we are created in the image of God. In verse 31, after the sixth day, God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. After the previous days, it said it was good. After the creation of man, God says it was very good. I can only imagine, uh, again, you, you, you try to imagine emotions with God, but the feeling of having created man and the potential that is there. Maybe it was a very emotional moment for God even, that mankind is now beginning a journey, a journey in which he can choose course. He can choose course. God gives him instruction. God tells him how to approach life. We can only imagine the things that God taught Adam and Eve in those first few days. Of course, then we come very quickly to chapter 3. And something is going to change. And it's such a small thing. Adam and Eve have run of the Garden of Eden. Again, to imagine a garden made by God Himself. You know, I struggled just to get grass to grow. <laughs> Can you imagine what God did in the Garden of Eden? Can you imagine the beauty that was there? And man has the run of the garden. But God said, you know, for your future and for life itself, don't take of the fruit of this one tree. But you can have everything. How many trees were in the Garden of Eden? Were there 100,000? Were there 20,000? Were there, you know, how many were there? And out of all of those trees, avoid this one tree. Because this won't be good for you. This is what I'm asking. So God who created man. Man had no doubt that God existed. Man had no doubt that God created him. He stood there next to him. And yet, he could not bring himself, couldn't bring himself to avoiding this tree. Now, Scripture tells us in chapter 3 that Eve was deceived. We read in the New Testament that Adam was not deceived, but he chose the tree anyway. Which you might say makes him even, well, I suppose more accountable, not that Eve wasn't accountable. They were both culpable in this whole episode. So you read the story where Satan, in the form of a serpent, lies to Adam and Eve. Verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall or you will not surely die. This contradicted what God had told them. This contradicted God Himself who created them. The serpent couldn't say, Well, I created you, now you do what I'm asking you to do. He could only try to entice them. He had no control over them physically. He couldn't do anything to them that I'm aware of. He could only reason with them and get them to conclude what? What's the big deal? What's the big deal? You won't die, the serpent said, when you eat of that tree. And indeed, they found out they didn't die. They must have been emboldened when they ate of the tree and realized we didn't die. Maybe God did lie to them. Maybe he was keeping back something really good from them. Now they had everything, but maybe God was withholding something even better. And they became convinced. Then they ran and hid when they heard God walking in the garden. And he says they hid because they were naked. Their eyes had been opened. But I think they hid for another reason as well. They realized they had disobeyed God. The common human reaction when you do something wrong is to either avoid it, deny it, or hide from it. Adam and Eve chose to hide from what they had done. And then when they're confronted, what do they do? What is the normal human reaction that seems to be a part of our genes since Adam and Eve? Deny, 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 pass the blame, pass the blame, pass the blame. From Adam to Eve to the serpent, who had no place to pass the blame. But Adam and Eve did, and for the next 6,000 years up to this very day, human beings deny, deny, pass the blame. It seems to be a part of who we are. It's a classic example of human beings 
making, of course, a very, very bad choice. But humanity has been making that choice in different ways ever since then. Let's fast forward to Luke chapter 22, and we come to the very Passover night. For three and a half years at least, the disciples had known Jesus Christ in an intimate way. That is, they walked with Him, they ate with Him, they spent all of their time virtually with Jesus Christ. They were convinced, at least they said they were, that He was the Messiah. They didn't quite understand this whole thing about dying and how that was going to happen, but they were committed, they said, to Jesus Christ. But chapter 22 of the book of Luke paints a little different picture of these men. And it's not at all flattering. Not at all a flattering picture of these men. They were truly human beings, similar to Adam and Eve, making choices in life. Verse 21 of Luke 22. At the very Passover itself, notice this discussion begins. But behold, the, uh, first of all, Christ initiates the discussion by talking about a traitor at the table. And this discussion seemed to go nowhere. Christ brings it up and it seems to die very quickly. There seemed to have been no interest in the disciples outside of asking, is it me? That there was a traitor in their midst. Their real discussion begins after this. It says in verse 21, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now that discussion appears to have lasted just a short while. Well, is, is it me? No, it's not me. Is it you? It's no, no, it's not you. It's not me. It's not me. Well, and then they go on to what's really on their minds. Verse 24. Now there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. We go from a discussion that Christ initiated on being a traitor to now it's, well, which one of us is going to be the greatest? They spent little time on the fact that there was a traitor and moved on to what was really sort of bothering them or on their mind that evening. Christ took the opportunity to lecture them. I, I suppose he must have been very disappointed in them. On the night before he died, when he talked about there being a traitor, and, he, and, and he, again, evoking memories of his death or, or thoughts of his death, and then, of course, the bread and the wine, talking about his body, and all of those things. And the thing on the disciples' mind was, which one of us will be the greatest? At that point in time, you have to wonder if Christ would not have been pretty disgusted or discouraged by what they did. They had a choice. They made a choice. Who of us will be the greatest? Pretty substantial in Christ's mind, I'm sure, on that evening. Had to weigh heavily on him. We don't know all of the things that he went to the garden and prayed about, but I wonder if this wouldn't be a part of it. That somehow God would perform a miracle on, in the minds and hearts of these men that they would truly step forward. Truly step forward and be the men they needed to be for the future. And of course we know they did. At that point in time, though, it had to be pretty discouraging. Maybe it was a little thing. It was just a discussion. You can talk about anything, right? Or was it reflective of what was going on inside them? And I truly believe it was. You know, the first part of preaching the gospel, and we talk a lot about preaching the gospel, the very first part of what Christ's message was in preaching the gospel was repent, which simply means to change. The word repent comes from a Greek word that actually means to change, to turn around, but it means to turn around twice. In other words, you have to turn away from sin and you have to turn toward righteousness. There are two different steps. Repentance involves both. Not only must you turn away from sin, that is you must put leavening out of your life, but you must turn to righteousness. You must eat unleavened bread. That's why I say the Passover and the days of unleavened bread form the very core of Christianity. It is who we must be. Not only the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior, but the removal of sin and the acceptance of righteousness in our lives. Just the removal of sin doesn't do a lot. Well, I guess it does something, obviously. But there's more to it. 
You know, we remove all the leavening from our homes. I had an individual tell me a few years ago that, that she felt that we really were missing the boat, that we were so focused on getting rid of all the leavening that we were missing the spiritual part of unleavened bread. And I said, well, if that's true, uh, then that's unfortunate that someone would miss the spiritual. But let me ask this, I said, if we don't do the physical, will we also be in danger of forgetting the spiritual? For example, if someone said, well, we focus so much on the physical aspect of keeping the Sabbath that we fail to understand the spiritual. And my comment was, if you stop keeping the physical, you will forget the spiritual. If you stop keeping the Sabbath, it will no longer be anything spiritual. If you don't remove the leavening, again, I, I suppose it's humanly possible that someone could still get the meaning of unleavened bread or understand it. I submit to you, if you stop removing the leavening, then you stop understanding the whole point. While it would be wrong to focus so much on the physical that you forget the spiritual, it is also wrong to forget the physical because you will forget the spiritual. And therefore, the Passover, the days of unleavened bread, provide insight into who we are and who we want to be. We want to get rid of sin, and we want to live a righteous life. Both of those are embodied in the days of unleavened bread. It is that important. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. The Bible also makes the point about little things and how significant they can become. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19 is sort of an, in some ways an enigmatic scripture. Maybe not so much, but I think maybe is. Matthew chapter 5 verse 19 it says, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But least, uh, sorry, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now I've wondered about that verse over the years because it, it seems to say something that maybe it really doesn't say. Is it saying that, well, if you, if you break the least of the commandments and even if you teach others to do that, You'll still be in the kingdom, you just won't be very important in the kingdom. So I find that a little contradictory because in the Old Testament, David says, you know, only to be a doorkeeper in your house. I think, now maybe I'm alone in this, that if I'm in the kingdom of God, I could care less if I'm the least or not. If I'm there, I'm there. So is that what Christ is saying? Well, it's, you know, it's important in, in, in some ways, but it's not all that important in the bigger scheme of things. Well, if you do a little researching, you'll find a couple of different approaches here. In Barnes' New Testament commentary, he says this. He says, the, the statement shall be called the least. He says, that is, shall be least. The meaning of this passage seems to be this. In the kingdom of heaven, that is, in the kingdom of the Messiah, or in the church which he is about to establish, he that breaks the least of these commandments shall be in no esteem or shall not be regarded as a proper religious teacher. Remember, the Pharisees divided the law into greater and lesser precepts. They made large portions void by their traditions and divisions. Jesus said in His kingdom, all this vain division and tradition shall cease. He who attempts this, breaking the least of the commandments, shall be seen as the least of all. Men should be engaged in yielding to obedience to the law of God without any such vain distinctions. So is Christ not condemning the Pharisees again for their uh, bifurcating the law? Well, the, these things are minor and therefore our traditions are greater. And therefore he's referring to now, you know, if someone who takes that approach is not a, is not a real teacher, it is not held in high esteem by those who will be in the kingdom or those who in this sense saying are in the kingdom. Adam Clark says this, he who by his mode of acting, speaking, or explaining the words of God sets the holy precept aside or explains away its force and meaning shall be called least. That is, shall have no place in the kingdom of Christ. Interesting. When you study the scriptures, you find that God never gave a pass to disobey any of the commandments. That is, he never gave a pass that, well, this commandment is less important than the other, so therefore, if you break it, it's, it's not a good thing, but it's not really so bad. Over and over again, we're told sin, the wages of sin is death. Not the wages of major sins is death. It's the wages of sin is death. 
Luke chapter 16, verse 10, another verse that you're probably familiar with. Uh, he that is faithful in little things will be faithful in big things. Are we not being told that God's law is significant and something that we should obey? We don't choose some and say, well, that's a minor thing, and therefore we can avoid keeping it. Is that the approach a Christian should take? Well, I think we know it's not. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 2, in Hosea writing his prophecy to Israel, he addresses five different sins. Look at Hosea 4, verse 2. He mentions five different sins. And I want you to notice one of the sins that sometimes we approach as being minor. I'd like to focus sometime on what we might consider a minor sin or one of the minor commandments and what impact it has on our lives today. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 2. Hosea 4 verse 2. It says, by swearing, says, he writes to the children of Israel, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. And he says, by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery. He mentions five sins that he says will break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. It's going to produce a real problem. The five sins he identifies, cursing, lying, stealing, murder, and adultery. Now, everybody, I should say everybody, but most people will acknowledge that stealing and murder and adultery are major problems. Now, adultery probably not so much today as it may have been 20 or 30 years ago even. But certainly cursing and lying, our government officials are famous for this. That's certainly not a big deal. I even hear occasionally, you know, uh, obviously, out of the abundance of the heart, maybe the mouth speaks at times, where we are, you know, here among ourselves. Words that are really not something you should be using. And yet it's no big deal. We hear it all the time. Our ears have become almost uh, dull to those uh, type of words. But Hosea listed here cursing, lying, stealing, murder, and adultery. If you were asked which is the least of all the commandments, you know, take the ten. Obviously, you know, uh, worshiping the true God, that's pretty important. Not taking His name in vain, well, that's, that's kind of important, but maybe that's one of the small ones as well. Not building an image, well, that's, that's probably pretty major. Uh, the Sabbath, of course, adultery, of course, stealing, of course, lying, where does that fit? Coveting, lying, where do those fit? Are those not kind of small things, sort of small change? You know, it's, it's, it's easy, at least in some ways, it's easy to see or know when someone has stolen something. You, you have an action that you can see, you can quantify. Or when someone commits adultery, you can kind of quantify that. You know what happened there. Uh, someone commits murder. But how do you quantify when someone lies? Well, the facts may, of course, show that they lied. But how do, you, how do you equate that with sin? Look at Colossians 3. If you do a study, you'll find the Apostle Paul spent a fair amount of time for addressing the subject of honesty and lying. It doesn't appear that it's really that small, but it's a small thing in some people's minds. Look at Colossians chapter 3. We find here that the direction from Paul within the church, think, consider this, Paul is writing to the church, and he says this, in Colossians chapter 3, we want to go there and take a look at verse 9. Colossians 3 and verse 9. He says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So Paul seems to identify lying as, as not really a small matter. Now again, the, the intent of my sermon is to address the fact that sometimes small things are obviously much bigger than you may think because of the impact they will have on you and on others. And lying is a good example. It's sort of an, a way of looking at this whole subject as we approach the days of unleavened bread and questioning ourselves in our own examination as to how we approach the truth. And I'm talking about in everyday life. But Paul says, don't lie to one another. He says, remember, you've become a new person. Well, how did you become a new person? Baptism, of course, back up a moment. Repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Spirit, you become a new person. As a new person, Paul says, stop lying to one another. It doesn't seem to have been a minor thing. 
He says, and you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. I also find it interesting that Paul goes back to that creation, that God created you in his image. He expects better of you. He wants better of you. Stop lying to one another. Be very, very circumspect when it comes to being truthful and telling the truth. We find, of course, there's no end to the scriptures. Psalm 19, verse 14, where it says, God hates lying. The seven abominations in Proverbs chapter 6, one is lying. So if you look at this as an example of something for us to look at in ourselves, you have to say that we sometimes give ourselves a pass. Well, you know, it, it's really not a big deal. Uh, I didn't hurt anyone. I was just trying to get through this without creating a big problem. So the best thing for me to do was to tell something that wasn't true. If you study the scriptures, you'll find there are different ways to tell a lie. As though you needed any help or I need any help, there, there are different ways to tell a lie. There's what's called the bold or the bald face lie. I had to check this out. Both terms are correct, uh, but they have slightly different meanings. A bald face lie is a lie that is so obvious it's kind of written all over your face. It's on its face, it's a lie. An example of that in scripture is when Cain was asked by God, where is your brother? And Cain said, what? well, am I his keeper? You know, this is a bald face lie. God knows he's lying, Cain knows he's lying, and yet, you know, I, I suppose Cain kind of assumes, well, maybe he'll give me a pass. Maybe he'll move on. And, of course, God didn't move on. Another way to lie is to tell a technical truth with the purpose to deceive. Technically, you're telling the truth, but your intent is to deceive. Is that a lie? Is that hurtful or harmful? There's a, a good example of it in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 20. Abraham and Abimelech. You know the story. Abraham is worried because his, his wife Sarah is so beautiful that he thinks the king, Abimelech, is going to want her and that he will kill Abraham in order to get his wife. And so Abraham tells a lie. Well, he told the truth, but his intent was to deceive, wasn't it? Genesis chapter 20 and verse 2. It says, Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. God wasn't at all happy with Abraham, and he gave a dream to Abimelech. And the dream said, Basically, if you take this woman, I'm going to kill everybody in your family. And it was, a, it was one of those dreams that it was very, very clear, and he didn't forget it when he woke up. And he then did a little checking and found out that Abraham had technically told him the truth, but it was a lie. It almost cost a number of people their lives. The entire family of Abimelech could have died because of what Abraham did. A little lie? It was technically correct, but his intent was to deceive. Have you ever been technically correct, but your real desire or intent was either to cast attention in a different direction or to take your attention off the subject and your intent was to deceive. Look at Leviticus chapter 6. What about business dealings? All of us, or most of us in this audience, I suppose in a sense working for the church is not quite the same, but you work for a company or you work for a, a business in the world. And by in the world, I, you know, that's not necessarily bad. It's not, it doesn't mean they're evil or wrong, but it means it's in the world. I've told the, the story before, and it's, it, it's always stuck in my mind. I was a young minister. I was too young to be a minister, and yet I was. And I was visiting people. We had lots of new people. This would have been back in the early 1970s in Georgia. And I, would, I was visiting this one. It was so exciting. You were visiting so many new people. And it wasn't unusual to get into a conversation that would last four and five and six hours. And I arrived at this home for this uh, a couple. 
uh, maybe 8 o'clock or so in the evening. And we were still talking at 2 a.m. And it was so exciting. They were, he was so interested in the church and just in making conversation. I said, well, where do you work? He gave me the name of the company. I said, oh, we have a member who works there. He said, what's his name? And I gave his name. And his face dropped. He said, I'm sorry. He said, I will never come to your church. If he represents your church, I never want to be a part of that. His language, what he does, he's dishonest. I mean, he went through all of these, these things. And I was very, very uh, bothered by it all. The next Sabbath, as I did every Sabbath, I saw this individual. He was at church with a big smile and a nice handshake. He was there. Now, again, I, maybe I should have said something. I'd never said anything to the individual. I was just so distraught over what happened. You see, a little bad example can go a long way in affecting other people. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, If a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord by lying to his neighbor about what was delivered to him for safekeeping or about a pledge or about a robbery or if he has extorted from his neighbor. In other words, your neighbor says, I'm going to be out of town. Would you watch over my home for me? And then the he comes back and you've taken something from his home and say, oh, somebody must have broken in and stolen it. And again, you are guilty, he says, and you have sinned a sin that, that will cause you to be put out of the camp of Israel. You lied about it. You didn't tell the truth. It's interesting. There are also descriptions, or there are, all, there are also guidelines in the book of, uh, certainly in Leviticus and the other books, the first five books of the Bible, that tell you about being honest. In other words, you should have an honest scale. If you're selling someone something, it goes by weight, it should be an honest measurement or honest weight, and it says if you're selling something by length, it should be an honest measurement. You shouldn't cheat anyone out of anything. Little things are important. In the New Testament, we find that if you claim to be a Christian, 1 John 4, verse 20, if you say you're following in God's way of life, and yet you hate your brother, it says you're a hypocrite, you're a liar. If you are following this way of life or claim that you're following God's, uh, or you, you know God, you say I'm, I'm a part of His way of life and, and you uh, don't keep His commandments, you're also a liar. Hypocrisy is another way of lying. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3 was slandered by people by what they said about him. Paul addresses it that, well, that's not me. But once a lie is told about you, it often or it rarely dies of its own, someone has to put it to death. And sometimes you don't even know to do that. Slander, lying, gossiping, telling things that are not true about someone. Do you ever go back and correct that when you find out it was wrong? It's very embarrassing, isn't it? It's very embarrassing. But what is the right thing to do? You know, in Jeremiah, this is another way that, that we, you can look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 27, there was a prophet, Hananiah, that said, I'm speaking for God. And you're going to come back home from Babylon in a, in, in a few months. And Jeremiah said, well, no, that's not true. That's not what God has instructed me to write. And so, which one was telling the truth? It's hard to know, at least if you were uh, the Jews at that particular time. Of course, God struck Hananiah dead before the end of that year. Now, f uh, flash forward to our day. How many times do you hear someone saying, and God told me to say this? Really? How did God tell you to say this? Well, did you have a dream? Did you hear a voice? Some people will say, well, I heard a voice. Are they representing that this is what God instructed me to do? Now, I think all of us would be very careful of that. But it's a very serious matter in God's sight for someone to claim he's speaking for him and he's not telling the truth or what he's telling is, is, is not true. It's a very serious matter. It's not a little thing. It's a very serious matter that you and I need to be very careful with. And I hope we, and I certainly pray all the time, every time before you, you speak or teach uh, God's people that what you're saying is correct. 
I've had to correct things I've said before, not because I deliberately said something wrong, but because it was wrong. I was a very young minister when an individual, a member, challenged me on the description of a phylactery. And I had said it wrong. I got it wrong. Now, it had nothing to do with my sermon except, you know, sort of a side point, talking about the Pharisees and the phylacteries and so on. And I, I described it wrong. And this lady came to me, and she was very nice about it. She said, well, you, you got it wrong last week when you said this. And I said, no, I couldn't be wrong. Well, I, I, was all, I was wrong twice now, but uh, I, it didn't take a lot of research. I said, well, I, you know, I'll look into it. I, it didn't take much research until I discovered, yes, I was wrong. And I had to acknowledge that. I, as a very young minister, it was begrudgingly done, but it was done. You try very hard to speak the truth because you are representing God's way of life. God doesn't rubber stamp everything that we say if it's contrary to His Word or His will, of course. We must be very, very careful. But that's one way that we see all the time in religion. I mean, if you turn religion on or religious programs on on a Sunday morning, you will hear this over and over again. Well, God put it on my heart. God spoke to me. God gave me this message. Now, sometimes they mean it maybe uh, without any real intention of saying, well, God directly did this, but, you know, I, I was led to do this or something of that nature. And, and maybe that's not the same thing as someone saying, well, God told me to tell you this this morning. Well, again, if God told him to tell me this, I'd, I'd want to hear it. But is that true? Is that really true? The prophet Hananiah said he spoke for God. He was dead within a year because he didn't speak for God. How many people today are claiming to speak for God who really are not? You know, there's a, a book that came out a few years ago that I found very interesting. Uh, the book was about respectable sins. And, and the, the premise of the book was that there are sins that are respectable in society and sins that are not. Respectable sins, what is that all about? He calls lying the sin of good standing. Lying, lying is the sin of good standing. Is that true? He says murder, adultery, murder, stealing, Sabbath breaking are all identifiable. And even society has laws against murder and theft. Adultery is a bit hard to die as a sin, but if you have, what if you have a temper? Is that a problem? Is that a sin? Can you make statements about another person that are not true? Is that, isn't that a sin? And he goes on with all of these small sins. Then there was another book that came out, and, and I found this a very interesting book. It sort of hits uh, it's right on, right on the, the nose uh, what the problem is most of the time. The title of the book gives it all away. Mistakes were made, but not by me. Mistakes were made, but not by me. By Carol uh, uh, Tavis and Elliot Aronson. She writes this, or the author writes this. In this terrifyingly, oh, I'm sorry, this is a review of the book. In this terrifyingly, uh, I'm sorry, terrifically insightful and engaging book, renowned social psychologists Carol Tar uh, Tavris and Elliot Ar Aronson take a compelling look at how the brain is wired for self-justification. When we make mistakes, we must claim, we must calm the cognitive dissonance that jars our feelings of self-worth. And so we create fictions that resolve us of responsibility, restoring our belief that we are still smart, moral, and right a belief that often keeps us on a course that is dumb, immoral, and wrong. Goes on to say, most people when directly confronted by evidence that they are wrong do not change their point of view or course of action but justify it even more tenaciously. Even irrefutable evidence is rarely enough to uh, pierce the mental error, armor of self-justification. Even irrefutable evidence is rarely enough to pierce the mental armor of self-justification. Isn't that what unleavened bread is about? Isn't the analogy of leavening and sin a clear dis uh, distinction of sin? You know, this is what it is. It's small, it grows, it expands, it creates more and more problems. Sin is not harmless. There are different types of, of hypocrisy mentioned in the New Testament. There's doctrinal error, which uh, Christ called hypocrisy, uh, hypocrisy, and he also uh, calls, of course, the uh, 
error, that is uh, wrongdoing, as, as hypocrisy when you're presenting yourself in another way. Removal of leavening is hard. You cannot remove leavening once it's done its job. You know, that's why you throw the bread out, because it's already done its job. Uh, to get leavening before it's done its job, you have to get it before it's involved in something. So sin should be removed before it's done its job. That is from the very inception of it is what, what God wants. That's what the lesson of unleavened bread is going to be about, getting rid of it before it does damage. Now that's hard because usually we don't recognize sin until it's already done its damage. So we come to the Passover in the days of unleavened bread, the very first thing we must acknowledge is that in order to get rid of sin, we must confess that sin. You know, that's a part of it. It's a part of what we must do. You know, we read in Scripture about the confession of sin. The people came to John the Baptist when they were baptized, confessing their sins, it says. Now, we go to great lengths to explain. You're not, you don't have to get up and tell everybody your sins. You don't even have to tell the minister your sin. But you must confess to God if you want Him to help you. You must stop it before it does its damage. You must remove the leavening as early on as you can. And therefore the preparation for Passover when the days of unleavened bread becomes so very, very important. I hope we can all, as we approach this year's Passover in the days of unleavened bread, take the approach of removing all sin as much as we possibly can, just as we take the approach of removing all leavening as much as we possibly can. The Rockdale County High School basketball team learned an important lesson back in 1987. They learned that even a small infraction was still wrong. They also learned to admit the infraction and not just ignore it. To me, it's a great lesson for unleavened bread. Acknowledging your mistakes, your sins, not trying to hide them, certainly not from God. Repenting of those sins, no matter how small that we somehow make this Feast of Unleavened Bread different maybe than the past. Passover tells us that we have an avenue to eliminate all sin. It isn't the fact that Christ's sacrifice can't cover every single sin because it certainly can. So it isn't for lack of Him or what He's done. It's always, of course, it comes from us and what we're prepared to do and what we're willing to do. Why can't this Passover in the Days of Unleavened Bread be that? where we are prepared and we're doing everything we can to remove all sin. You know, Christ's sacrifice was given for all of us. If we learn the lesson of the bulldogs from Conroe, I'm sorry, Conroe, Conyers, Georgia, in Rockdale County, never tolerate sin even in the smallest manner. Isn't that a good lesson of unleavened bread? If you had to summarize unleavened bread in three words, what would you say? I would say acknowledge, repent, and remove. It all begins with an understanding that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And as long as that's there, sin is coming. And that's a problem. If this festival becomes a turning point in our lives where we commit ourselves to removing all sin, being honest and sincere in everything we do, isn't that what God wants? Isn't that why Christ died to bring us to that point? Since man took a hard right turn back in the Garden of Eden and didn't live up to his potential that God created him with, and you and I, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, have the opportunity to go back there and make a different choice. Make a different choice and choose to remove all sin. Rather than tolerating even a small amount of sin, or violating the least of the commandments. Can we not commit to removing all sin? It's the only way that we can truly represent the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ who died for us. This is the last opportunity I'll have to speak to you before Passover in the Days of Unleavened Bread. Mr. Burnett won't let me speak anymore. Uh, <laughs> but no, that's not true. Uh, obviously, we're only two weeks away, and I hope and pray that you will have a wonderful Passover and the days of unleavened bread will be as meaningful this year as they've ever been in your life.